and welcome to Booklust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today is Bob Putnam, the Malkin Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University. Bob, whew, I got that out. <laughs> Thank you for, uh, for coming on Booklust today. I've been looking forward to this, Nancy. Well, your new book is called Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis. And when I read this, I, I, it, it, it just, it's a combination of um, look, narrative, looking at kids and data that you and your team of researchers has accumulated. Right. And I have to say that um, most um, depressingly, it kind of underscored everything that I'd been feeling for the <laughs> last number of years. Yeah. Will you talk about how you came to write this book and how, how it was created? Sure. Yes. Um, well, for the last 20 years, I've been interested in writing about, but mostly as social science, writing about how American society has been changing over the last um, 30 or 40 years. Um, and American society has been changing in some important ways, sometimes for the better. I mean, we're a less sexist and a less racist society than we were, but sometimes for the worse. Um, uh, in Bowling Alone, I argued that, that we are a less connected society, we're a more individualistic society than we were 30 or 40 years ago when I was growing up. It's also known, of course, that there's been a growing uh, income gap in America between rich folks and poor folks. And a little less well known is that there's growing segregation in America between rich folks and poor folks. That is, we're no longer connecting across class lines. Um, and that was the backdrop, and I knew about that. And, and I, wanted to, I wanted to ask, well, what are the effect on kids of those big macro uh, changes and I suspected that there was a, a kind of a gap between mm -hmm. rich kids and poor kids but until we did the research honestly we had no idea how rapidly growing and how deep this gap is between kids rich kids and poor kids I say rich kids and poor kids I don't mean you know Bill Gates's kids and right. some homeless person I mean basically kids from college educated families right. that's what counts as rich and that's yeah. the upper third of America and kids coming from high school educated homes, which is the bottom third of America. And, um, well, as I say, when we actually did the research, <coughs> my team and I were shocked, both by the quantitative evidence of this growing gap between rich kids and poor kids and by these stories that we found really appalling as, we, mm -hmm. as, the, as the interviews began to accumulate. Because it sure seemed, uh, reading your book and observing just what's happening, that, that the opportunities for high school, kids who come from families whose parents are have high school educations or less, right. you know, just has <coughs> narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and narrowed. Right. And it wasn't, I grew up in Detroit mm -hmm. um, at, at, at about the same time you were growing up in Ohio. Right. And we had, our experiences there were, were different than right. what's happening today. Yeah. I remembered growing up in this little town on the other side of Lake Erie from, from Detroit. Uh, I remembered growing up there as a pretty egalitarian kind of place. But then, you know, as I became more uh, expert in social science, I thought, well, that might have been really just Golden Glow, mm -hmm. remembering a nicer place than it, than it was. Um, but then when we went back and interviewed, we interviewed all the surviving members of my graduating class in 1959. We're now, you know, in our 70s, and, and you can sort of see how we've done in life. And the remarkable thing is that we've all done amazingly well, and not because we're smarter than anybody else, but just because the time right. and place that we grew up allowed all of the kids, both from the right side of the tracks and from the wrong side of the tracks, to do better than their parents did. And that's what I had remembered, and that yeah. turned out that was right. There was a, it was a not, it was, it was a time of racism and sexism. I'm not trying to say it was a perfect place, but it was, in class terms, it was much less divided and much less unequal than Port Clinton itself has become. That was yeah. the other, really, the real shocker for me was when we, we began interviewing now, kids who are now growing up in Port Clinton, and they are living, now the kids on the right side and the wrong side of the tracks are living in different universes. It's mm -hmm. just, it was shocking. Yeah, I remember it at my high school in, in Detroit, which was a magnet high school, drew from all over mm -hmm. the city and had different um, uh, tracks. So there was the college track and there was the auto aero track and right. the acting 
and all of that. But I wonder, uh, I, and one of the people that went to my high school at about the same time that I did was Diana Ross, mm -hmm. who came from the worst housing project, Brewster Douglas, the worst housing project right. in Detroit. And, and you know, I, I, I had a big graduating class, unlike you, which was right. a smallish one. I had a big graduating class, and I'm sure there are people who did, who, who, who achieved more than their parents had. I'm sure there are people who didn't, but but there was the sense that education, there was a safety net, first right. of all, and there was the sense that education could advance your your opportunities. Sure. Um, well, and to take the, the case of my uh, high school graduating class, um, the most remarkable example of that is that um, there were two black kids in my high school. So Portland is a mostly, mm -hmm. and was and is a mostly uh, white town. And they encountered racism in town. I mean, yes. there was racial prejudice and, and, and um, even a cross burning at one point while we were growing up. But those kids, these two black kids, both of whom came from homes in which no one had ever gotten past the third grade in school. Both of them graduated from high school. That's a big deal. They both went to college on scholarships. Mm -hmm. They both graduated from college. They both went to graduate school. They both have graduate degrees. Now, if you think about the upward mobility embodied right. in moving from a third grade education to a graduate degree and a successful professional career in one generation, yeah. that's astonishing, even in the face of yeah. real right. uh, racism and, and, and sexual uh, gender, gender bias. That's, they're, they're, they embody the fact that your what your dad did for a living had very little impact on how you ended up, even right. in terms of what track. Both these kids were in the college prep track, although um. you might say, well, you know, how did they get in the college prep track? They're from a really poor background, and they're, and they're black. How did they end up in the college prep track in the 50s in a, in a yeah. little white high school? And the answer was there was very little not, there was not, I'm not saying there was none, but there was very little what you might call social tracking with one set of kids going into the college prep track right. and not one set going into the, you know, the general or vocational track. That wasn't true. And that, you know, there was a risk, Nancy, in beginning the book with a chapter about my own hometown. Mm -hmm. and I knew all along there was a risk because it looked, it, it makes me vulnerable to the charge that I'm engaging in nostalgia. And, and I'm, I was aware of that, and I, half the first chapter, as you know, is about racism and sexism right. in Portland, because I'm trying right. to say, no, 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 it's not perfect. Right. But right. It, You're not looking through rose-colored glasses right. at your past. But um, what I wanted to be able to show, including people who, who didn't live through that earlier period in our history, was this is a real place. These were re kids were growing up, real kids, who lived where there wasn't such an astonishingly large gap between the experiences right. of rich kids and poor kids. It's, it's basically to say, you know, having a more equal society with more opportunity for all kids isn't some crazy Swedish thing. We did it in America. Right. And that's why I wanted to track the history, beginning by tracking the history of this little town. Yeah, and, uh, you know, so what, what changed? What, uh, what do you think, what was the impetus for this sure. downward downward, almost downward mo mobility. Yeah. I don't think that's exaggerating too much. No, it isn't. Um, I mean, we should say, so that your, your, your uh, listeners know, that the experience of the kids who are now growing up on the wrong side of the tracks, poor kids in Portland, is really almost unspeakable. Right. These are kids growing up in not just broken, but shattered families with very low income, and basically nobody is paying attention right. to them. I mean, that's the, if there's a common denominator, in the experience of poor kids in America today, it is that they are alone, they are isolated, they have no or almost no experience of trustworthy adults in their lives. Their families are often untrustworthy, right. the schools, they, don't, they can't trust the schools, they, they don't have neighbors that are paying attention to them. And that, you, you, you will remember that one of the kids growing up in Port Clinton now, a woman that we call Mary Sue, that's not her real name, um, posted, actually on Facebook, not that long ago, just a few months ago, she posted, love hurts, trust kills. If you imagine growing up in a world, this little town, yeah. in which you can't trust anybody, it's devastating. Yeah. So to go back to your question, what's caused all this, 
in Port Clinton, you can see pretty clearly because it's a little microcosm. You can see the collapse of the factories right. um, in town. There were, when I was growing up, there were a number of, of manufacturing plants that basically did auto parts for uh, yep. that sh they yeah. shipped off to Detroit. to Detroit. Um, and there was a fishing industry, but then Lake Erie, you know, the fishing right. the fishing died in Lake Erie, and the plants all closed. If you go back to Port Clinton now, you see these giant factories surrounded by barbed wire that yeah. look like you know decaying cathedrals or something. Um, they were cathedrals. They, they were. were cathedrals to capitalism. Right, and, exactly. And, uh, pe and they were, people had really good paying jobs. Yeah, right. um, those mostly went away in the 1980s. Um, and, and the next generation of, the, 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 the next generation of Port Clinton High School graduates came out in the, in the 80s and basically couldn't ever find a job. And, so that the, and, and that is the first part of the story. That's a Rust Belt story. Right. But it's important to underline that we then did the similar kind of research in places that were not Rust Belt at all. We did the same research in Atlanta and in Orange County and in right. Austin and in Duluth and Chicago, I mean uh, Philadelphia and Boston. So the underlying story isn't just Rust Belt. It's the, it's the collapse of a decent living for working class people. That's the first right. part of the story. And the second part of the story, as I say, is this growing segregation of American society between basically rich enclaves and poor enclaves. Right. And in Port Clinton, you can see that very visibly because most of Port Clinton now looks like a, you know, a, a very depressed city. Mm -hmm. But the shoreline there along Lake Erie is very beautiful. And, and when I was growing up, it was orchards and you know, fishing camps and mm -hmm. so on. But now there's a, essentially one long gated community along Port Clinton, it's 20 miles long and about 150 yards deep of million dollar mansions. And, and, it's, and gated, and that gated. I think is a, is a key word in and, that description. And you know there's a street down in, in Port Clinton, if you look to the left toward the lake, the sense, there's a census tract there that has zero child poverty. But if you look to the right on the other side of the road, there's a census tract that has 50% child poverty. And that separation of rich people and poor people, rich kids and poor kids, is another part of what's going on here. Well, I, you, you know, I know that, that your background was in psychology and that you have won um, the Humanities Medal, so you have that, you know, so you're, 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 you look at the world from a wider lens, I, I, I think, than, than many of us do. And so I feel comfortable asking you this question, <laughs> um, which is, so do you think people's, do you think human nature has gotten, has changed <clears throat> from, um, and we go back to FDR sure. and, and all of those social net programs that right. were set up. I mean, do you think innately we, we are different, um, that we don't, there isn't that, I'm thinking about the governor in Kansas, yeah. you know, who wants to punish the poor sure. by saying what they can. And, sure, sure. You know, this viciousness that we have toward, that many people have toward right. those who are less fortunate, that we blame them. Well, um, uh, first of all, let's say, I want to say that there is one sense in which we are very different culturally, and that is actually embodied in the title of the book, because when I was growing up in Port Clinton, and my parents talked about doing things for our kids, they did not mean my sister and me. They meant all the kids mm -hmm. in town. There was a general sense that we were all in this together, and you know, they kept voting for higher taxes to pay for right. pool, uh, swimming pools in the schools and French departments and right. so on, long after we were, we were gone. And, yeah. and they meant really all the kids in town were part of our kids. But what's happened over the last 30 years, and this is a little bit the story of Bowling Alone, is this shrinking of our sense yeah. of connection with other people. And now if you talk to people about our kids, use, they, when people use the expression our kids, they mean my biological kids. Right. And it's just a sad, true fact that in Port Clinton now, nobody thinks of Mary Sue as one of our kids. They think she's somebody else's kid. Let yeah. them worry about her. So that is a big cultural right. change. I'm not sure I would use the term um, human nature human has nature, changed, but, yeah. but it certainly is true that in that respect, we become a more, but a more, in, I mean, a more individualistic and self-focused society. But I have a slightly longer and I suppose more optimistic interpretation of this because there are previous periods in American history which are actually deeply like the period we're right. in now. Yes. The best 
parallel is the turn of the 19th to the 20th right. century, the previous Gilded Age, actually, yes. when there was a then a big gap, I'm talking about 1890, 1900, right. that sort of time, big gap between rich and poor people, a sense of, well, and also uh, that was a period of massive immigration, so the complexion of America was changing. It was a time of, of um, uh, political corruption and political degradation, a lot of parallels between yes. that period and, and our period. And then in a pretty short period of time, historically speaking, I mean, basically 10 or 15 years, that changed. And if you'd been around in 1890, you might have said, because the philosophy then was social Darwinism, right. you know, everybody out for themselves and the devil take the hindmost, <laughs> where are we, you know, right. what's, what's happened to the America? But then basically through, uh, there are a number of things that contributed to that change that led then in the first decades of the 20th century to the progressive era and a, a ton of new reforms and that's what I'd like to happen now. Yes, and, and one of the new, one of the, one of the reforms, one of the reforms that came out of the Gilded Age was free high school. Absolutely. Pub public high schools right. for, for everyone right. and, and that, that was the, a way to level the playing field in, you know, in some way. Sure. But what is, so what, what do you think is the the high Parallel. School. What is yeah. the high school today? Well, I've thought a lot about that. Um, uh, I think the underlying logic of the high school, let me say what that was and then I'll ask yes. what it might Go be. Ahead. The underlying logic was, and it was, it was invented actually not in, not in Washington or in, in Cambridge, it was invented in small towns in Kansas and, and Nebraska, and it, it involved rich folks in town, the banker or the lawyer or the rich farmer in town, agreeing to pay higher taxes so that other people's kids could get a secondary education. So, so seeing that there was a public good Absolutely. behind, uh, uh, that superseded their having to pay a little bit more. That's right. And, yes. and moreover, it turned out it was the best public policy, decision, public policy decision America ever made because it turned out and the economic historians now are very clear about this, that single invention, that is the pub free public secondary education for everybody, way more than paid for itself because it was responsible for right. all the economic growth of the whole 20th century in America right. from that one decision and it leveled the playing field. So yes. it, was, it was a smart decision, but it was a little bit of a gamble decision, yeah. right? So yeah, rich right. people had to say, right, I'll pay for these kids, other kids' education, right. and, and eventually it'll probably help me out. So that's what we need to do now. We need a sort of a way of, of, of people who are well off saying, you know, it's part of, it's in our self-interest. Yes. What Tocqueville would have called our enlightened self-interest right. to invest in other people's kids. Now, what's the institutional form that might take? Well, I think early childhood education is, a, is the most right. promising example of that. Community colleges might be another example of that. Early childhood education has the characteristic that we know it works. The evidence is quite clear that it does work. So if you give kids, you know, one, two, three, four years old, professional education, not babysitting, but pro well, it's right. expensive to do it. It's like the yes. high school. It's yes. expensive. You got right. to do it, but to do it right really works. You get a high payback. Right. And we know that these class gaps that I trace in the book begin very early. You there. Red, their full, the gap, the, clo the gap between rich kids and poor kids is fully visible before kids even get to school. Right. Oh, yeah, definitely. And yeah. so that's my hope. Right. But right. there are a lot of things we can do. I mean, and, I mean the, the, the early childhood education has the feature that at the moment at least, it's not a red versus blue issue. The mm -hmm. most comprehensive early childhood education program in America is in Oklahoma. Right. The reddest of the red. Right. Um, now, you know, there's an issue, there's a risk that in this intensely polarized political system we have now that will, as we focus on the question of, of this gap, that we'll have an argument about who's to blame and, mm -hmm. and, you know, we'll have an argument about is it really a red problem or really a blue problem. I'm trying to hope, I'm hoping that if we focus on the kids, we can maybe avoid a little bit of that ideologically charged debate. So, who do you want to, who do you, int who is the book? Intent. Do you know what I mean? Who is the book sure. intended for? The, I mean, the interest. 
Well, okay, I'll stop there. Who is the book intended well, for? Well, the short answer is book readers, but what yes, I mean right. we, we, no, but no, but I mean that in a very serious way because we know what book readers are like. We know that book readers are well educated and and very likely themselves in the upper third of society. So I'm speaking to people who are on the upside of the opportunity gap and their kids are very likely doing pretty well and there's stories in the book about right. what, you know, the lives of kids like my children and grandchildren right. and your yes. children. So I have in mind that audience, um, but I'm, but I have in mind the audience of people who just honestly don't realize what has happened to the to the lives of poor kids. Right. The reason that there, my previous books don't have a lot of stories. The reason this book has a lot of stories is I'm trying to hold up to the educated, reasonably well-off Americans. I don't mean you know Bill Gates, but reasonably right. well-off Americans. Say. Do you know how kids are living today? Poor kids, do you want to live in an America like that? that? And I'm betting yeah. that those people, if they actually see, you know, what the what the world has come to, actually, will basically say, ah, that's I don't want to live in that kind of America. And I don't want my grandchildren to live in that kind of America. You know, there's a genre. This will seem a little self-important, and I apologize that's for that. There's a genre into which I hope this book fits. Um, in that earlier turn of the cent turn of the last century, the leading into the progressive period, there was a, a book um, by a journalist called How the Other Half Lives. And basically it was a description aimed at the silk stocking Upper East Side of Manhattan of the tenements on the Lower East Side yeah. of Manhattan. And it basically was saying to the folks, the readers up on the Upper East Side, look how, look what life is like down yeah. there, just, you know, a couple of miles from you. And, and in fact, what we know now is that that was part of the process by which America came to grips with the class gaps right. in that period. Similarly, Michael Harrington in the 60s yeah. had this book called The Other America. And again, The Other America was saying to affluent America, right. it's great you're affluent and all that, but how about this other America right. that's poor? I'm a little bit betting that there's still this fundamental American value that basically everybody ought to get a fair a fair start. How do you remain um, optimistic in the face of uh, government um, intransigence? And yeah. I do because fundamentally I know how social change happens in America. I mean, you, that's what uh, you've studied, and you, and, and you can see not that it's certain that this is that, that we're going to enter this new age in which people focus and understand these problems, but that we've done it before. And as I said before, what I really want to say is, I'm not saying America ought to suddenly become Sweden or something. I'm saying just, you know, go back to fundamental American values. This is a core American value. And I'm betting, in other words, that the changes, this narrowing of our, of our horizons to our own selves and our own kids is a reversible phenomenon. I know it's, we've been through cycles like this before in American history. You can see them. Yes. And so I'm just hoping, yeah, we let's turn it around. Well, I, I wish we had more time to talk about bowling alone too, but we don't. Be, but bowling alone, I'm I'm a librarian, and my big thought, of course, was that the library is the place where Absolutely. where all of this happens. Um, Actually, I, you won't know that I wrote another book uh, called Better Together, in which there's a whole uh, chapter. Oh no, I did know that <laughs> on libraries. I, that's right. That's right. So I know that you're both a library supporter and a reader. Right. So who do you read for? You know, you travel a lot. You're yeah. on planes a lot. Who who do you read for fun? Um, I'm I really like uh, history. Uh huh. Me too. Um, so. Uh, I read, I'm, uh, I've read everything David McCulloch has ever written, including the new book that's not yet out. That's but right, I, the Wright Brothers. I've got it, I yes. got a pre-publication copy yeah. from, because he has the same editor that I do, so I got a pre-publication copy, and that's what I'm reading actually uh -huh. on the play now. Um, uh, I like the, the work of, um, of uh, the, the, the work that's embodied in, in um, you know, the, uh, Lusitania. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Eric Larson. Thank you, Eric yes. Larson. I was having yes. an Alzheimer's yeah, interview. I like Eric, all, Eric Larson's, all uh -huh, of his stuff. Uh -huh. Actually, I wasn't, I liked some of his earlier books better than this most recent right. one because there wasn't quite so much suspense in the most yes. recent one. 
but I like the that. ship sinks. Let's, right, exactly. Let's, let's do a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but I like his, and I love his writing, and I uh -huh. love the. Um, uh, I like Simon Winchester's work. Uh -huh. Actually, he, we, he he doesn't he lives not very far from us in New Hampshire, where we, in, in, he lives in Western New Hampshire in Western Massachusetts, so we've had some connections. Um, I, I loved actually Boys in the Boat, and I'm saying that not because we're sitting in, right. in Seattle. I tell you what I liked about really all these books, but the, it, it's embodied in, yes. the, in Boys in the Boat because, of course, there's the, the drama of you know the rowing and the, right. the stroke, and, and, and then there's the, the backstory about, uh, about Nazi Germany. But the thing that I most liked was the histories of these boys, the personal histories of mm -hmm. these boys. Um, I've now forgotten the name of the, the central uh, rower in the boat, but he grows up in the middle of the Depression. Um, and he's, at one point, his family, who are living out on the Olympic Peninsula, actually kick him out kick of the house. Out, yes. Yes. And it's one thing to say the Depression was really hard. It's another thing to read the story of this kid who's kicked out of his home because right. of the, the economic uh, pressure. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not saying that I read all history just for the social science of it, but I like the close-up embodiment of these right. larger larger social trends. Uh, um, I interviewed Richard Norton Smith, whose yeah. new, new, newest book is The Biography of Nelson Rockefeller. Right, I'm reading it actually. Oh, is it? It's yeah. fascinating, it is. I thought, and it's, you know, I mean, both of us lived through, you know, that period, sure. and, but yet there's so much that I had not remembered or had not Correct. thought about. And, and one of the things that I came to think of, uh, that Nelson Rockefeller, for all his public flaws, was somebody who cared about the arts and he cared about, yeah. I didn't care about Attica Prison so no. much, but he, you know, there was a lot of um, positive change in New York, at least, sure. when he was governor. Well, and I, I actually, I, I, I'm reading several things at once, and I am in, actually, I've not <laughs> gotten, I've, he's not yet become uh, active in politics in the book, but there's this long four story right. of, of the, uh, uh, I mean, his prehistory, so to speak, of the Rockefeller yes. family. And it's highly relevant to what we're talking about yes, now, right? Because Rockefeller Sr. was the guy, was one was of the- Was the Gilded Age. <laughs> exactly right. Embodied. But then, and you have to admire this, actually, he and then his son raised their children with a sense of noblesse oblige, a sense that actually, you know, you're comfortable, you've got a lot right. of money, and therefore you've, you've got to think about how other less fortunate people fit into the world. And I don't, neither of us wants to gild the lily here, but I think it is true, actually, that Nelson Rockefeller's life and career and his family origins embody the kind of change, actually, now to make this big jump that I right. want to have happen now. I want right. to have people who are you know, quite wealthy or wealth, or even not so wealthy, but well off now, I want to have them start thinking about other people. Yes. That's actually what the, the, the intergenerationally the Rockefeller family did. Yeah, and uh, this would be a whole, again, a whole, I feel like we could keep talking, but I mean, I, if with the rock, with John D. Rockefeller Sr. Right. Um, a lot, and his wife, a lot of that came out of their religion. Absolutely right. And I think that's something else that's, um, you know, has changed a lot and what role that might have. There's your next book. Well, my last book actually was on religion oh, in America. Oh, that's right, it was. I knew that. <laughs> that's right. American Grace. But it, it's right. true. I will just say in a shorthand that I think getting the American, American faith communities now, today, to focus on this problem, a right. problem of the opportunity gap, is close to being a necessary and sufficient yeah, condition for reading this. And I think, you know, Pope Francis, well, he's really yeah. strong on this. Right, definitely. I'm not pessimistic. <laughs> I'm, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bob Putnam, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks. And good luck with the book. And Thanks very everything. much. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed it. Thanks.